thanks again for the opportunity to speak. Uh, we have a lot of material. Uh, let's get right into it. I'm going to talk about these main issues with you today. We're going to talk about my book and evidence that came out of the book, which tells us the truth about climate change. We're going to talk about this dangerous new cold era that's coming. We're also going to talk about the fraud of man-made global warming. The truth is we have been misled by the United Nations and our own government, Republican and Democratic administrations, about the truth of our climate. You're going to hear the truth today. I'm going to urge and discuss with you when the last one uh, happened and how we need to prepare for this next climate change. And I'm going to add a new component to our discussion with the introduction of the International Earthquake and Volcano Prediction Center, a new science organization I have been asked to chair by scientists around the world. If you read my book and you hear my presentations, there are two fundamental messages that come out of it. They are both profound, they affect everyone in this room, and they will affect generations to come, your children, your grandchildren, your neighbors. First off, the sun has gone into a state of hibernation. My research showed five years ago when I first detected this cycle that every 206 years the sun does this. When it goes into hibernation, it cuts back on its energy output. It makes the earth cold. The last time this occurred was in the period of roughly 1800 to 1820. And according to uh, historian John D. Post, it was the world's greatest subsistence crisis because this cold era, this cold phenomena, destroyed much of the planet's crops. M many, many people starved and froze to death, including here in the U.S. Second, in page seven of my book, you'll see another important statement that says, when these cold eras come, we also have our worst ever earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. It's amazing that the sun controls so much of our life, and we're gonna talk more about that. This is Al Gore's worst slide. <laughs> Al Gore and company, the United Nations especially, and all the sustainable development people out of the UN and now ensconced in our government structure here in the U.S., believe that what comes out of our tailpipe controls our climate. I don't agree with that. I believe it's the sun. Do you agree with that, that the sun runs our climate? Many of us for many years have thought, have thought that was the case, but we really never had the evidence we needed. In fact, we have been denied the truth of climate change. One cannot go to the mainstream media and find the truth. It's simply not there. What you will find is lies, deceptions, smoke and mirrors, all in an attempt to foist an, ag an Agenda 21 or Sustainable Development Program throughout the world. It is not a global mass right-wing conspiracy. It is a fundamental socialist conspiracy that has begun many decades ago. And as Dr. Kaufman has mentioned and Ruth Esser have mentioned, this is now a major global effort for a new form of one world order. So who am I to tell you these things? Who am I to tell you the truth about the climate? Uh, whereas Al Gore, a far more distinguished gentleman than I am, <laughs> tells you something else. Well, everyone needs to know a little about the speaker's background when they get up on the stand. You heard a little about me, but let me focus on items seven, eight, and nine. It says that I am a leading U.S. expert on the next climate change to the decades of cold weather that I have predicted and author of an internationally acclaimed book called Cold Sun. That's true. And in fact, the word leading here does not mean necessarily I'm a leading scientist in the field, but in terms of one person in the United States telling the truth about the next climate change, regrettably, that is me. That is a sad and tragic and lamentable situation, but that's where we find ourselves. The scientists across the U.S. and across the world who know the truth about the climate cannot and will not tell you the truth for a lot of reasons some of which you already know. Power, money, political influence, fear, all of these factor in. 
one of the most successful climate change prediction experts in the U.S. based on the RC theory. I'll explain that later. Everyone needs to understand what I have said, what I have predicted, what has come true, and what has not come true. Fortunately, there's not much of the latter just yet. And again, uh, the reason that I am now the Chairman CEO of the International Earthquake and Volcano Prediction Center is because of my work in climate scientists and climate science and my book, a group of internationally recognized experts in earthquake prediction came to me in September of last year and asked me to pull together the world's best prediction experts and finally begin a regular process of predicting the world's most dangerous earthquakes before they happen. I have been honored and humbled by that uh, request and we'll talk more about that later. Item 10 is very important. As soon as I said that global warming was coming to an end, that a new climate era was coming, that the sun was going into hibernation five years ago, I was immediately attacked from every side of the political spectrum. Conservatives, liberals, the media, the scientific community, everyone attacked me for making such bold statements. I came out of the space program. I was not a climate scientist, wasn't an environmentalist or conservationist that anyone could tell. I certainly wasn't a senator with a documentary out of Hollywood. <laughs> By the way, good old Al calls me a pseudo-scientist who counts sunspots. <laughs> I'm more polite when I talk to, to Al, but uh, that's my background, and, and I hope you'll find from the evidence I'm about to give you that people like me are out there, and we do know what we're talking about when it comes to climate. The book that I wrote, is displayed here. It's called Cold Sun. Please go to Amazon.com. Anywhere online you can get the book for half the price. I could sell it to you if I had any today. I apologize. Didn't have time to bring any in. But here are some of the comments that came out of that book. These are from other eminent scientists around the world. I have been uh, extremely uh, gratified by the reception this book has received. These comments come from great geologists and other thinkers of our day. That's an incredible statement. It comes from uh, Dr. Tsunoda, uh, Professor Emeritus of Ge Geology from a major university in Japan. Uh, you can read the rest of them there. I want to thank my wife for this final <laughs> comment. She couldn't be with me today. I asked her to write a more glowing biography and post it on the web, so you may be able to see that later. Uh, thank you. Uh, Man-made global warming, I think everyone here deserves to know where I stand on it. I'll let you read that for a moment. Do you agree with me? Man-made global warming is the greatest scientific fraud in the history of science. Fortunately, I heard someone else make a comment similar to that. Uh, the courageous Senator James Inhofe from Oklahoma has called it uh, one of the greatest frauds ever perpetrated on the American citizenry. Uh, there are a few of us who are standing up and making these statements. I hope after today there's another 150 making that same statement. Uh, this is easily proven, by the way. There's really not a lot of effort to prove fraud. You have to go back to the people who started this and you'll find out they said they were going to defraud us. They actually were bold enough to say that. And if you listen to Dr. Kaufman's presentation and you listen to some of the other authors he quotes about the liberal, the extreme liberal progressive mind, they think that they know everything and we know nothing. That's why they're so bold to tell us up front they're going to defraud us and they're going to get away with it. So why is this greenhouse gas theory a fraud? Uh, I could spend many hours talking about this. But basically, uh, it came out of the UN. We were told that for the foreseeable future, as long as CO2 continued to go up, the Earth would get hotter and hotter. Glaciers would melt and flood the coastlines inundating major cities. That hasn't happened. In fact, CO2 continues to go up. But guess what's happened to the global temperature? Has it gone up? No. 
Global temperatures have been dropping. We don't see that on the front page of our papers. We don't see it on the evening news, but that is the reality. I'll show you the data, the same data that the UN uses to produce their fraudulent reports. We're brazenly told by the leading proponents, again, that they were going to deceive us. And if you look at the actual CO2 that they say is driving this, that comes out of our tailpipes and our factories, it is really a minuscule, insignificant amount. The natural production of CO2 is 20 to 40 times greater than the worst case scenario of mankind's production. But they ignore all that. In fact, the UN reports ignore much of what drives climate, and they had to in order to get this fraud instigated. One thing that scientists do, as a rule, that is fundamental to the scientific method, once we have a theory, we go out and we explore that theory. We do all the testing and the data and the analysis, and then we come back and look at the theory and say, does the data match up with the theory? With the UN, it never matches up. If you go to the last UN report on climate from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, you'll see several scenarios made from 20 different global climate models that predict, based on how much CO2 is produced by mankind, not nature, but mankind, which temperature growth chart will apply. If you go back and look at all of them, none of them worked. Now this is fund fundamentally important if you're a scientist or just a layperson. If the theory never works, we should discard it. Those of you who've kept up with some of this have read some of the exposés of emails between cooperating scientists on this fraud of climate science, uh, Climate Gate 1, and now there's a Climate Gate 2, another thousand emails that came out. And there are two key things that one sees in all of these emails, and there are several books out on this subject alone. One thing you see is scientists actively corrupting the data, covering up the data, to show that their fraudulent reports are correct. It's a fraud. The other thing you see in reading these emails is that what should be there is missing. We don't see emails between these UN scientists that say, we should be doing everything we can to make sure our science is correct and our data has ultimate integrity before the people. That's what we should be reading in these emails. Instead, we're reading just the opposite. It's a cover-up. It's a deception. That's what we read. If you go back and you trace the origins of climate change vis-a-vis -vis the UN and its intergovernmental panel and the well-described Maurice Strong, you'll find out that all of this got started back in the UK when Margaret Thatcher was trying to battle coal miner union strikes that were devastating their economy. She wanted a way to get out from under coal as a fuel source so she wouldn't have to mess with the unions anymore. She went to an outdated uh, scientific theory from 1896, which was dis disproved when it was first proposed. And she said, aha, this man-made CO2 thing might do it. I can convert us all to nuclear, and we can get rid of the coal unions, and I'll be free of that problem. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how it all started. The Iron Lady herself had no idea this was going to be so corrupted and become so global that it would come back to haunt future generations of UK citizens, much less the US. But that's exactly how it got started. Uh, Nigel Calder does an excellent video on this subject and he explains all of that. But what we find when we go back and we look at all these UN reports, curiously, there are two little universities in, in England, the Hadley Center and the University of East Anglia. They're two of the most primary centers for excellence on climate change used by the UN. They come out with a database called HADCRUD. It's a combined data set of global temperatures and other things. 
So why is it that two little obscure unknown universities in England became the source of all this? Because Margaret Thatcher pumped lots of money into them to tell us, right or wrong, but in a predetermined method, to tell us that CO2 produced by man is at the source of all evil. And now you know the rest of the story. That's how it all began. AGW, anthropogenic global warming as we call it, or man-made global warming, is, as I've alleged, the greatest fraud in the history of science. It is the greatest fraud because of the billions of people who will suffer because of it. But you in this room will not have to suffer because after you hear the truth today, you'll know what to do in the future. Today, we're going to tell you what your future will be from a climate standpoint. But there's a bridge we all have to cross. I had to cross it five years ago. I thought I was fairly up uh, on climate science and just about any other major field of science. I've just finished a classified project for the White House in, in Iraq. I was very much doing my own research for various other reasons. I had actually started another book, not Cold Sun, but another one. And then I realized at 2 p.m. April the 26th, 2007, what the truth was. It was a scientific eureka moment, but it also made me very angry and very upset because at that time, not only did I calculate when the next global climate change was coming and what would happen to us, but I also realized I had been deceived for 20 years and that it was intentional. And that an educated guy like myself could be so well deceived. It was a tough bridge to cross. We all are going to have to cross that bridge. It was a deception from the start. I'm going to quickly go through this because I want to get to the hard data that you need to talk to your friends and neighbors about what's really happening in the climate. Uh, Dr. Stephen Snyder, one of the foremost university professors, the late Stephen Snyder, was well quoted on his statements that we have to come up with these scary scenarios about man-made global warming in order to get the media attention, get the politicians and, and so forth to support it. That's a deception. Al Gore's comment. It's appropriate to overrepresent the facts. That's what a vice president and almost president of the United States said about global warming. This is the kind of people we put in Washington. Oh, this is great. Even if global warming is wrong, we'll be doing the right thing in terms of economic and environmental policy. Isn't that nice? We're going to lie to you, the American people, because we know better what's right for our country economically and environmentally. This gets back to the Gaia philosophy. We want the Earth and Mother Earth and the rocks and the streams to be of more priority than integrity among our people. Uh, Maurice Strong, by the way, came out of Canada. He was an oil patch guy and then got elevated within the Canadian structure. So this comment from a former minister of the environment of Canada is very appropriate. No matter if all the science is phony, there are collateral environmental benefits. Climate change provides the greatest chance to bring about justice and equality in the world. Dr. Kaufman spoke on this justice and equality issue at length. But here is probably the most telling and concise statement about what's happening. We're going to give you phony science. We're going to lie to you. We're not going to tell you the truth about what's happening with the climate because we have this hidden agenda that we define in the progressive liberal community about what is justice and what is equality. And we're going to force it on you regardless what you want or what you believe. We could go on and on, but let me give you this comment from Maurice Strong. The most rotten apple in the barrel. Maurice Strong, who started the Kyoto Protocols, the Environmental uh, Development Program at the UN, and created the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in 1988, really has his own devious evil agenda. Now, Dr. Kaufman talked about the word evil many times. There's no other way to describe what Marie Strong is thinking in his head when he starts all these environmental efforts in this climate change program of the UN. He wants to reduce our industries to nothing. 
He wants them to collapse. Those are his words. And he says to the, all the UN, this is Rio 20 years ago, by the way. He wants everyone in that international group to help make that happen. He says it's our job to make it happen. How evil is that? And this is the guy that was in charge of the entire UN environmental effort. He was also the same guy that took and endorsed a nearly $1 million check from Saddam Hussein as payoff for his role in the oil for food scam. This guy needs to be on another planet, not on this one. Do you agree with that? He was fired after, after the Volcker Commission. He was fired from the UN with congratulations by Kofi Annan for a job well done and now he's living in China, doing more mischief there. Next chart. We've been through this many times before. Every time there's a cold or warm period, the media and the scientists get their heads together and they say, oh, well, we're gonna fry, we're gonna freeze. And then 20 years later, we're gonna fry again, and then we're gonna freeze again. This has been no news. What is different about this modern era in item six, the global warming of the last 20 years or so, has been because it followed the very productive and successful modern environmental movement creation. It created among all of us an awareness about our environment which made us ripe for the fraud that was to follow. We became fertile ground for this new concept that man-made CO2 was ruining the climate. Now, I don't know how much time you all have, but here I was coming out of NASA, uh, consulting, White House consulting, being a space shuttle engineer, running high-tech companies, and I was totally too busy to go study the climate, to really know who was telling the truth and who wasn't. Once I did, again, I crossed that bridge because I realized I had been deceived. But this has been going on routinely for 150 years. And now here we are in the disastrous global cooling. This chart only talks about the last 110 or 115 years or so. This cycle that I discovered in April of 07 is 206 years long. Every 206 years, going back 1,200 years, the sun goes into hibernation. When I first detected this, I called the top solar physicist at NASA and I said, Dave, I've just run over your data and your forecasts and you're wrong. You're 100% off in what the sun is going to do in the next solar cycle. Now, Dave is, I'll just mention his first name. Dave's a good guy. He's really a good person. But Dave's got his blinders on. He only looks at near-term sunspot trends. And he's written an excellent paper on the 100-year cycle, which I also independently discovered, but he missed completely the 206-year cycle. If, if you're standing at a railroad crossroads and your car is stalled out, and there's a train conductor there and he's saying, oh, well, you don't have to worry, the 20-minute train just passed. So you've got another 20 minutes, we'll push the, 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 tr the car off the tracks. But he has forgotten that the 25-minute train is coming around the bend. And that's what we've got here. The bigger train, the one that's loaded with tons of ore going to the steel plant, and at high speed is about to come around the bend, and you don't have 20 more minutes. You've got less than five. You've got to get that car off the track. That's where we are. The cycle has changed over. Global warming fully accounted for in the 206 year cycle has ended and now the global cooling has begun. I announced this April and May of 07. I said within three years global warming will end, the sun will go into hibernation, the Earth's atmosphere and oceans will start to cool and a new climate era will begin. We'll talk more about that. So let's look at the data. Here's the last 30 years. Now there's important data to, to see off any chart, but let me point to this period right here. This is where the green line peaks. You can forget the red line, it basically starts where the chart starts down here. 
and it ends where it ends. It doesn't tell you what's happening in the future. The green line is the fifth order binomial. It's a math term, but basically it tells you what's the underlying trend. The underlying trend shows that right in here, global warming peaked, and we've been in a steep decline since. Let's go to the next chart. Here's a closer view, the last 20 years. Here's the very high temperature of 1998, the warmest year this century, possibly tied with 1934, but most likely the, best, the hottest year. And here's when it stopped, leveled out, and started to drop. Let's look at the last 10 years. Next chart. Here you are, ladies and gentlemen. Follow the green line, and now you can follow the red line if you wish because now everything is down. And look at the steep drop, it's dropping even more rapidly. I made my prediction right here in a very warm year, 2007, the same year that Al Gore was told he was gonna win the Nobel Peace Prize for creating awareness. <laughs> I think he created something else, but I can't use that in public discussion. But. If you extend this back to 1998, ladies and gentlemen, 14 years of declining global temperature. How many times have we seen on evening news and read in the paper, the Earth's getting warmer and warmer and warmer? Certainly, it's countless. Over the last 14 years, when we've been told the Earth is getting warmer, it has not, it has gotten colder. That's the truth. Take that home, tell your friends and neighbors, Ladies and gentlemen, there is no global warming anymore. Do you believe me? Yes. Thank you. Let's look at the details behind what's uh, in the global warming. Let's look at the oceans, because I'll tell you now, as the oceans go, so goes the rest of the planet. The oceans are a vast, unfathomable, no pun intended, uh, heat sink, it absorbs energy, it releases energy. The cycles of the ocean currents, the Al Gore community would have you believe react just like that. They do not. It takes hundreds or thousands of years for currents in various parts of the earth to complete their cycle. That is one of the primary reasons that we still see CO2 going up, even though temperatures have started to drop rapidly. Because the vast majority of CO2 on this planet is in the oceans. It has little or nothing to do with the last 100 years of man-made CO2 production, which is still a minuscule part of the total. Because all that CO2 that's in the oceans was created 800 or 1,000 years ago. What we're seeing is a natural growth cycle in CO2. Anyone that studies the cycles of CO2 and glacial ice ages, where we've gone back and pulled ice cores and measured the CO2 can tell you all that. This chart gives you a big picture for the decline in ocean temperatures. It's very similar to the 30 year chart you saw before for the atmosphere. Let me show you, however, what happened. Right in this area here, 2005 to 2007, Temperatures peaked. They dropped dramatically historically in 2008, which very few people read about in the newspapers or saw on TV. Peaked again in 2010, but look at this. If you extend that line down through the center of these other lines, we're down to here right now. We're dropping rapidly. Pardon the chartsmanship. The next chart, I'll, I'll update it, and we'll be down here. Dropping rapidly. Next chart. When it comes to the ocean temperatures in the northern hemisphere, we follow two primary cycles. They have their own cycles, 40, 60, 80, 100 years long. In this case, I'm talking about the PDO cycle, Pacific Decadal Cycle. It's a 50, 60 year cycle, but I'm showing 100 years of it to give you a bigger picture here. Here you can see how the cycle drops, peaks, drops, peaks, and drops again. We are currently in the dropping phase of the PDO cycle. We will hit bottom right in here if we haven't hit it already. And look, what, look what happens when you get into a bottom cycle. How long does it stay cold? 40 years. Closing in on that last 30 years, as you can see, the Pacific Ocean, Northern Pacific, has been dropping like a rock for 30 years. The other major cycle we follow in the Northern Hemisphere is the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, or AMO cycle. 
similar to the PDO, but not in the same phase as uh, at all times. It goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. The next time you hear a, a presentation from Sid, this cycle will ring true to you because where we were told that fishing stocks were depleted by overfishing, and in some cases that's true, on a global basis, not true at all. If you look at what's happened in the salmon area, for example, we were told we'd have to stop salmon fishing. We did, it ruined a lot of businesses and a lot of jobs in the Northwest. But it was all because of a natural cycle. Salmon stocks because the PDO cycle is what it is. It's getting colder. When the oceans are colder, we have more fish. It's that simple. It's that simple. Okay. We've had a lot more fish in the uh, Atlantic, but guess what's going to happen here? We're at peak. Just like here, it's going to drop like a rock fairly soon. We're at peak. See these peak lines here? Look at the similar pattern we see here. We're at peak. Now the AMO cycle may still stay warm for a few more years, but then it's going to drop way down, down here. It's going to be the coldest in 200 years. And when it's cold, the PDO cycle will be at bottom. The Pacific and the Atlantic will be the coldest in 200 years, and it will last for 40 years. How many in here were told that for two years the Earth underwent a dramatic reduction in sea levels? Maybe 10% of you. Why isn't it that everyone on this planet knows that, that it was front page on the New York Times and the Chicago Tribune and the Orlando Sentinel, the Miami Herald, and the Pensacola local paper? And why weren't we seeing that on ABC, NBC, and Fox News? Never saw it. Never saw it. It wasn't a major event. It was being covered up. It was being covered up because it did not fit the UN's climate model didn't fit, so you're not going to hear it. As Dr. Kaufman has indicated, the media isn't going to tell you the truth. I am here to tell you after five years of providing all the data to the mainstream media, including Fox News, none of them are willing to tell you the truth. That is very sad. That is very tragic. I think there was a good book, Not Cold Sun, a better book, that once said, the truth shall set you free. And that's what we need more in this country than ever before. This current administration promised to restore scientific integrity to this country. It has gotten much, much worse. Do you agree with that? Yeah. I have issued a press release. It's, on the it's now the current press release on the website for the Space and Science Research Corporation. It tells you my forecast for the future on the uh, sea level decline. Sea level decline for two years. We continue to see news about warming, rising sea levels, the threat to Florida, blah, blah, blah. Let's go to the next chart. I'll tell you what's really happening with sea levels. This is a very, very important chart. You need to understand this chart and tell your friends and family. This tells you what's really happening with global sea levels. It's the rate of increase or decline, not where it is on any particular day, but how fast it's going up or how fast it's going down. This is the annual chart, and it goes back to 1998. Obviously, sea levels were really growing rapidly during the warmest year of the century, but then they dropped rapidly within a couple of years. In fact, below this line, that means the sea levels are dropping or shrinking. Global sea levels shrunk in 2000, we weren't told about that, were we? No. We weren't told again in 2003 and 4 that global sea levels had dropped to a near record low. We certainly weren't told that they broke through the line again in 2007 and 8. In 2007 and 8, good old Al was getting his uh, Nobel Prize. The U.S. government was telling us that the Arctic was disappearing. The head of the Arctic Research Group at NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, said that by 2008, all of the ice in the Arctic would be gone. That's the lunacy that we have been getting from our government. 
It went back up, but look what happened again. This is the two-year drop that we saw on the previous slide. Never before recorded in the era of satellite detection of global sea level. Never before seen. Did anyone see this on the front page? No, instead, what did we see? Global sea levels are rising. We were lied to. For two years solid, we were lied to. In this uh, bottom July of last year, when I last talked about this chart, I predicted it would go back up. It immediately did, not because I said so, but because the math <laughs> said so. And we're, we're <laughs> Thank you. We're back up here, and if you do some simple line drawing, you'll see that the high end should be about here. If you draw a line through these peaks, it should be about here. And the low line, drawing these three, could be way down here in the next cycle. All of this led me to some basic math calculation. I issued a press release that said, global sea levels are now on a permanent decline, and we will soon enter a phase where this chart is pretty much reversed where we'll see mostly below the line readings. And that will certainly come when the PDO and AMO are in phase and we have 40 years of record cold temperature in the oceans. The way sea level rises, ladies and gentlemen, is not because of how much gas we put in our cars and trucks. It comes from the heating of the ocean. What causes the heating of the ocean? Other than Al Gore's ego, it's the sun. The sun heats the earth. The sun heats the oceans and expands the water, and that's what causes sea level rise. Now that the sun is going into hibernation, it's lockstep. We're in for global sea level drop for decades. That phase has already begun, and this chart, sea level annual rate of decline, proves it. So who can you trust? We can't trust the TVs, we can't trust the media, the mainstream media. Some papers are very good, but most are not. Who can you trust? Can you go to NASA and find the right data? Not the current NASA. The last NASA administrator was effectively fired for not following President Obama's climate change policies. The president put in another guy he thought he could manipulate. Major General Charlie Bolden, an astronaut who has been embarrassed by our president, and yet he's a trooper, he's staying in there, but he knows the truth. <laughs> you can't go to the NOAA administrator or the president's science advisor. That's why almost two years ago now, after reading the reports they sent to Congress, I called for the firing of the NOAA administrator and the firing of the president's science advisor for lying to the people in the U.S. Congress. Did I do the right thing? <laughs> My friend, is the ongoing tragedy we have in our country. We have universities in this state and throughout the U.S. and very good scientists who have sold out us, who have sold out the Constitution, who have sold out their job and their integrity for the almighty dollar given to them by President Obama to do only man-made global warming climate science. Have they done us a disservice? Yes. But we can change this overnight. We put a new guy in the White House who can get rid of this fraud and overnight issue a real executive order that says, I'm not going to fund any more man-made global warming climate research, and you better start telling the people the truth about this new cold era and get us prepared, and I will fund that overnight. Every university and every climate scientist will all of a sudden say, aha, I knew this all along. Yeah, yeah I'll be glad to do that research. <laughs> So what evidence do I have to say that this solar hibernation is for real and everything that comes from it, the new climate change and so forth? Well, not only did I predict it, I confirmed it and had a press conference 1st of July, almost four years ago, the lower four, and announced officially that global warming had ended in a TV news conference. Several things happened right after that. The global, uh, the Chicago Climate Credit Exchange collapsed within 30 days. 
I am really proud of that. <laughs> the term global warming was all of a sudden no longer used in the White House. It went to climate change. So they could co-opt the new cold era as also being caused by mankind. Other things have happened since then. And as you now know from uh, Dr. Kaufman and others, uh, now that the king has no clothes, everyone knows the earth is getting colder. The Rio Plus 20 conference even got rid of climate change. It's now sustainable development. This is the lunatic mind of the progressive left that wants to constantly stay in power and tell us how to live our lives and are willing to lie to us to do so. But since all of this has happened, the NASA has now confirmed my prediction, so has the National Solar Observatory and the U.S. Air Force. In fact, some of these same scientists have now stepped forward and said, yes, this is true are saying it's going to be much colder than what I am predicting, which is bad enough. We're going to have to go very quickly. This is a bigger picture of the sunspot cycle. It shows the Maunder minimum and the Dalton minimum by name, named for various people who studied that era. The Dalton minimum was very cold. It was during the uh, last war with Great Britain. Thousands of people in the U.S. froze and starved to death in the U.S. In 1816, we had the uh, era called the uh, uh, year without a summer. We had snow and ice in the middle of August. All the crops were destroyed. We will have worse happen this go round. Some scientists are saying that it will be as bad as the Maunder minimum. In the Maunder minimum, New York Harbor froze over. You didn't need the Brooklyn Bridge. It wasn't built then, but it could, you could have walked between the islands and you can do so again if it gets that bad. The Baltic Sea was frozen over. They built hotels and homes and shops on the Baltic Sea because it stayed frozen over for so long. The River Thames froze over. They had fairs and festivals on the frozen Thames River. If that happens, ladies and gentlemen, if we have a, a cold era as cold as the Maunder minimum, the death and destruction, the global and social and economic upheaval will be biblical in scale. I'm saying it will be at least as cold as the Dalton minimum. That's going to be bad enough. This just shows the predicted uh, sunspot cycle we're in. I predicted it would peak in 2012. Guess what happened, ladies and gentlemen? Exactly what I said. Now, we get a double peak. See the double peak here? But the main peak came in 2012. We're now dropping, coming back up to the double peak in 2013. But when I called the head of NASA's physics group, I said, we're going to peak in 2012 with a sunspot count of about 74 on average. Look at this. 50, 75. With, with the double peak in here, we're going to be maybe even less than 74. It looks like I hit it out of the park again. But I wasn't the only one. There were other scientists that did so. That's right. We have a lot to go through in a few minutes. This is a chart by a friend of mine that shows the big picture for the next few decades. It shows the global warming we just went through, and now we're heading into a prolonged multi-decadal drop. This is a mathematician's uh, interpretation of my prediction in my RC theory. It shows the bottom temperature statistically will be 2031, according to his formula he developed from my theory. My theory, math, showed the year 2031. Dr. Abdus Samatov, the Russian scientist whose chart you last saw, said the 2030s. Dr. Theodore Lanshite, one of the foremost late researchers in this field, predicted decades ago that it would be 2031. We're all on the same sheet of music. We're going to have the worst cold in 200 years. We're going to have a lot of crop damage. Ladies and gentlemen, there's not a lot of good news about this new cold era. The good news is that you're hearing it perhaps for the first time in this room today. And you can tell your children and your grandchildren to be prepared. What do you do when you go to the store in two years and there's no bread? Because a freak cold front came through and wiped out the Montana wheat harvest. 
That's the kind of thing we need to be prepared for. Unlike the smooth chart that you saw, we're going to get freak cold events that come through, especially after these major volcanic eruptions block out the sunlight. It's going to be that kind of scenario. We have to be prepared for dramatic, historic, major geophysical events in the future. This guy didn't prepare. He went into one of the worst winters to take over Russia in 1812 and came back not with 600,000 men that he started with, but 40,000. Many died on the battlefield in combat, but most froze to death. I mentioned the volcanoes and earthquakes. Next year. This is the big one here in the U.S. The last time we had a solar hibernation, the worst earthquakes in U.S. history occurred, the New Madrid Fault. This fault is still there, still active. It could break open again. If it does the last time, like it did the last time, it will devastate the U.S. economy beyond measure. Much of the economic traffic of the U.S. crosses the Mississippi in this area, from uh, southern Tennessee up through Indiana. The Wabash uh, seismic zone combined with the New Madrid Fault, when they rupture like they did the last time, we could see three magnitude eight earthquakes within a few months' time. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means no bridges, no railway, no interstates all shut down, broken apart, and you can't fix them for years. In fact, the problem we had with the last fault rupturing in 1811 and 1812 was the fact that by the time people got in there to help those who had been devastated and started rebuilding, the next big quake came along and destroyed everything they built. We won't be able to go in and rebuild for a long period of time. This record earthquake in uh, Japan, we all know about the Fukushima uh, Daiichi nuclear plant that was destroyed, we all know about that. This is a depiction. Here's an inset that shows Japan. This is a close up, here's the epicenter. Uh, and of course this area was devastated. 10 months prior to this, I issued a press release saying we have now entered solar hibernation. All the math shows that we're going to have record earthquakes from now on. Ten months later, this occurred. Wow. <clears throat> Same thing with volcanic eruptions. Mount Tambora, the largest recorded ever volcanic eruption occurred during the solar hibernation of last uh, event. We're going to see more of this for the future. Next. Uh, as a result of my work on climate change, a group of scientists came to me in February of, uh, I'm sorry, September of last year and said we really like what you're doing to tell the truth about the climate. Now we need you to bring all the world's best prediction experts on earthquakes together to form a new entity so that we can start saving tens and hundreds of thousands of lives each year by predicting earthquakes. Ladies and gentlemen, we can do that now. And we have just begun to do so. Here are just some of the scientists involved. You can go to the website, iedpc.org, and read all of them. These events are coming. Uh, they tend to follow the ring of fire, but not necessarily. This is the one we predicted. It is imminent. It could happen any day now. It's off of Kamchatka. It will send a tsunami across the Pacific. The next big one, and the really big one, will be right here, south of the Philippines in the Malacca Sea. 2.5 million lives are at risk. We're trying to get the word out. Next. So what can you do? Be prepared. Be prepared for not having enough food. Be prepared for the panic, more important, that will come by people who are uneducated and think the government will take care of them. 40% of Americans think it's the government's job to care for them. What do you think these people will do when there's no food on the shelf? Be prepared. Bottom line, item seven, we heard it from the gentleman over here. Don't just walk away and say, wow, that was an interesting presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, you must prepare. Thank you all.